Hello, I'm Askar Sharif, and you're watching the news from Kazakhstan. The funeral of Jalmurza Bigbaouf was held in Aktobe on Tuesday. He was killed during the shootout with the police on June 23rd. According to the relatives, there were many bullet wounds in the body and the head of Jalmurza. Around 200 people have gathered at the wake. Jalmurza Bigbaouf's body was taken away from the morgue only on Monday and after a quick prayer he was taken to the cemetery. His relatives didn't allow the journalists to record the funeral on camera. 20-year-old Jalmurza was the middle of three brothers and after the death of his parents he spent two years in an orphanage. Later he got married and used to rent a room in a hostel. Neighbors described him as a quiet and communicative person. His fellow religious friends remember that Jalmurza started practicing Islam one and a half years ago and giving shelter to many homeless people in his room. They also said that they have never seen those two guys who were spotted near Jalmurza on June 23rd. Brother of the deceased cannot believe that Jalmurza was able to attempt armed resistance to police. Three suspected in the assault on the lieutenant of the border outpost in Timak in the village of Kokterek of Saragash district of South Kazakhstan region have voluntarily arrived to the police and detained. The law enforcement have informed that one more underage suspect was temporarily let free and his measure of restraint was not yet chosen, but the issue of his arrest will be resolved as well. Meanwhile, local residents blame the lieutenant who opened fire. More details in the next report. The incident at the South Kazakhstan border has caused outrage among local residents. According to the official report, the officer used a weapon in self-defense, firing warning shots into the air and in the wheels of the vehicle. The local bystander was wounded and died from the injury as a result. Bibai Shaya Simbekova, the witness, described what happened in details. A few meters from the gates of the outpost, young men got into an argument, which quickly turned into a fight. And then one of them started chaotically firing his assault rifle, recalls Bibai Shah. There were shells all over the place. They were fighting, shooting and killed a bystander. He was shot right in the head. There was so much shooting that even an iron kiosk was riddled with bullets. A stray bullet hit the 18-year-old Nurjan Kaipayev in the head, approximately 150 meters away from the site. His brother took the wounded boy to the rural clinic, which apparently failed to provide even basic first aid, redirecting the patient to the regional hospital. The young man died 10 hours later, never regaining consciousness. I looked out of my car and saw a man in shorts shooting. I haven't even managed to get out of the car as I saw my younger brother on the ground. I put him in the car and drove to the rural clinic. There were two nurses and there they only had bandages. They told us to go to Sarayagash hospital. Some youths come from Abai and the guards were afraid of them. What kind of border guards are they? They got scared, opened fire and killed my little nephew. They shot him right in the head. Doctors couldn't even render him first aid. They were very rude and told us to take Nurjan anywhere we want but there. Let Nazarbayev see all this. He talks about the border, but this border kills our people for pennies and whatever else they fail to divide among themselves. In the meantime, the border guard department assured the press that the lieutenant in question was on duty and firearms were used in self-defense. The officer was performing his line of duties at the time of the accident. As to why he was only wearing shorts and a t-shirt, the investigation is still underway. Once it's over, you'll be informed. Local residents still cannot recover from the shock and blame the lieutenant for the tragedy. Villagers say that they encounter impunity and lawlessness on the part of border guards almost daily. So many people die or become disabled here at the border. I believe the guards are responsible and this case is not an exception. They all only think about money. Three suspects in the attack on the Intamak border outpost lieutenant in Kokterek village surrendered to the police voluntarily. All of them are residents of the Sarahash district of the South Kazakhstan region and are now waiting for the end of the investigation in a temporary detention facility. Afghan war veterans proposed on Tuesday to organize inspections of borders. This way they want to improve the catastrophic situation at the borders. Veterans commented on the official version of the emergency at the outposts and gave an evaluation to what happened. However, some disagreements emerged as of inspections. Some proposed to involve the ruling party, others think that Nuratan inspections will be useless. The head of the border outpost, Tersayruk, and two contract soldiers who possibly were involved in beatings of conscripts were placed under two-month arrest. On Tuesday, this information was confirmed by military prosecutor's office. If the detainees will be found guilty, the court will sentence them to very serious terms. <laughs> The detainees are charged with excessive power or official authority. The penalty for this type of crime is from 5 to 10 years in prison. 
In addition to MPs who promised to examine all frontier posts within six months and adopt new amendments to the Law and Border Protection Service, local peacekeeping soldiers are also demanding the government to look into the situation in the army. They believe that emergencies at the southern and eastern borders raise questions about the effectiveness of border protection services, thus threatening the country's independence, which even may lead to destabilization of the situation in Kazakhstan. Members of the Association Veterans of Kazakhstan place hopes on the ruling party. They propose to organize unexpected inspections on frontier posts with Nuratan members and also set up work assessments tests for senior military staff. These reports must be publicly released via official media agencies. The MPs should be aware about the situation at the state border and avoid receiving information from secondary sources. This measure will give the MPs a tool to control the security and availability of our borders. Pera Yelobayev also commented on the case of Private Chelakh and expressed no doubt about the official theory. He says the soldier could technically kill 14 fellow soldiers and a retired NSC major general. On the other hand, the head of the Veterans Union Fighting Brotherhood, Sergei Bashevich, says that the theory is questionable. He notes that even Rangers receive unsatisfactory scores during firing practices and Private Chelakh is absolutely incomparable to them. Bashevich is also very skeptical about veterans' proposal. How could these inspections benefit us? What will change after they inspect these outposts? Who among the ruling party can improve military discipline? What tools do they have? Are there regular officers among the party members who have experience of serving at frontier posts? Afghan war veterans agree on one thing. At present, the recruitment of border troops is done very irresponsibly. They argue that in the past, conscripts had to go through six-month-long screening before being assigned border protection responsibilities. Nothing of the sort is done now, and even less worthy of soldiers end up there as contract soldiers. Relatives of Denis Ray appealed to the Committee of Soldiers' Mothers. The mother of the killed border guard at Arkan Kirgen outpost, whose remains are still un unidentified, Tatiana Ray, hopes that after the interference of public activists, she will be able to bury her son. It's been three weeks since the incident on Arkan Kirgen border outpost, but they act as if nothing happened. Yes, we would like to hear the updates from someone. And what do you expect to hear from us? We have nothing to say except that we want updates from officials. How long they intend to keep us humiliated? On Tuesday, Mangistau Region Court upheld the decision on the arrest of the leader of Alga political party pending registration, registration Vladimir Kozlov and public activist Sirik Sapargali. The decision was appealed by the attorneys. Lawyers say that the reason for filing an appeal was the ruling of the Janauzian City Court from June 12, 2012. In this document, the judge Dusmagambetova extended the arrest warrant against Kozlov and Sapargali for another two months without properly notifying the defense, barely in absentia. Advocates believe that this is a violation of laws, in particular Article 10, Paragraph 153 of the Penal Code, which clearly describes the rights and interests of defendants. Upon studying this case, the judge basing by for to uphold Janauzian City Court decision and to dismiss the complaint. Alia Tulzbekova, wife of Vladimir Kozlov says that the court has violated the fundamental principles of criminal proceedings, the protection of rights and interests of the defendant, along with the principles of contentiousness and openness. Despite the fact that this was an open court hearing on Tuesday, the judge Bissimbaev, referring to an Article 322, didn't allow the media to make audio and video recordings. Even though the prosecutor said that the Janauzian city court did not violate any laws and that Vladimir Kozlov must remain under arrest, the main principle of criminal justice, which is protection of the rights and interests of the defendant, has been violated after all. This is a blatant and outrageous violation of basic laws that should be exercised by judges. Instead, they reveal their bias. Turns out the judges unfortunately follow not the norms of the penal code, but their personal beliefs, which are not so clear. U.S. and Russian human rights organizations, as well as the German government, express interest in the destiny of political prisoners Jean Bolat Mamai and Bolat Atabayev, who were transported under guard to the Aktau detention ward from Almaty. In the meantime, a large-scale campaign in support of public activists is rolling all over Kazakhstan. On Tuesday, Mamai's colleagues issued statements expressing their readiness to fight for the freedom of all who, in their opinion, are illegally charged with crimes against humanity. Jean Bolat Mamai was chosen as ideological leader of the website Janauzian.net. Its editor Inga Imambai and the founder of Journalists in Trouble Foundation Rosa Taukina informed of the appointment at a press conference in Almaty. The website staff hopes that Mamai, who is currently held under arrest, will be able to write articles and pass them through his attorney this way, keeping in touch with the outside world. The journalists also touched upon another major project, a soon-to-be-published book about December events. It will contain eyewitness reports, official statements and other information collected 
conducted by mass media and public activists. We have collected all the materials and are going to release it as books dedicated to December events. Daukina called on her colleagues not to turn a blind eye to the fate of stage director Bolata Tabayev, who is accused of inciting social hatred together with Mamai. Their names have already become familiar to Russian activists, and the Commission on Journalist Protection in New York, along with Moscow's Freedom of Speech and Extreme Journalism Foundations, have stood up for the public activists. The reporters of Janauzian.net are also planning to hold a series of protest actions in Kazakhstan. It should be noted that three organizers of rallies will stand trial on June 28th. They held a picket near the pre-trial detention center of National Security Committee on June 15th, following the arrests of Atabayev and Mamai. We will keep fighting for justice and freedom, as well as our colleague Jean Bolat Mamai and stage director Bolat Atabayev, just like for every prisoner of conscience repressed by the authorities. This week, the theater director was spotlighted by German newspapers. Atabayev was expected to be present at a Gerthy award ceremony, and the news of his arrest shocked everyone who was following the theater director's fate. German director Volkler Schlendorf took a stand for the arrested Kazakhstan citizen with an open letter to Tib Berlin. It is completely inconceivable to me that Bolat Atabayev has ever done anything other than creative artistic work. His whole temperament doesn't lend itself or make him at all suitable for political agitation. Like your great poet Abai Aitmatov and Tolstoy, his interest is naturally with the disadvantaged, persecuted and poor. I appeal to your sense of justice and humanity to release Mr. Atabayev. I hope that justice will prevail and Bolat Atabayev will be able to take part in the awarding ceremony of Gerthy Medal, which will be held on August 28th in Weimar. Meanwhile, people are collecting signatures to nominate Bolat Atabayev for the Nobel Prize. Zauresh Batalov, a city public activist and initiator, hopes to see 10,000 signatures from social networks and public committee members in favor of the stage director. The release of Orak Sarbapiev, the ex-mayor of Janauzian, suspected of embezzling public funds and bribery, has caused mixed reactions in the community, in particular inside the oil city itself, which was headed by the now-acquitted Sarbapiev. Many Janauzian residents are dissatisfied with the court verdict. However, they believe he should have been tried not just for embezzlement. The officials should not get away from the December riots that ended tragically, say activists. More opinions in the next story. <laughs> The acquittal of an ex-mayor of Janauzian, Orak Sarbapev, has split the population into two groups. Some residents of rebellious Janauzian believe he is guilty primarily for the December events and not for budget funds embezzlement. Others, fearing persecution, are trying to whitewash the official. We haven't seen any wrongdoings from Sarbapev. It is true he did not do anything wrong. I have personally attended several of his meetings. People only need to hear pleasant words which are good for the ear, and no one needs that dirty talk. Hassan Dusikenov is the father of 24-year-old Atabirgen Dusikenov, who died from a policeman's bullet during riots at the Janauzian Square. Atabirgen, who worked as a coach in a local school, did not want to go to the square on that day, but the principal forced him to attend Independence Day celebrations. Dusikanov Sr. believes that it is entirely the fault of the ex-mayor Sarabapev, who ordered the school principal to send people to the square. At the policeman trial, where Sarabapev was a witness, Dusikanov was the only one who asked him four direct questions, but never received a single answer, although two were rejected by the judge. <laughs> We are not satisfied with the court verdict. We are not going to give up as long as there are aggrieved families. There is no justice. Nobody thinks about our people. I feel sad because there is no one I can share my grief with. Orazali Mambit Nazarov, another resident of Janauzian, also opposes the court verdict. His brother Orazai was severely beaten up by the riot police on December 16th. Later, the 45-year-old man succumbed to the injuries. As a victim, Orazali considers that Sarbapev should have been punished for the riots. He does not want to reopen his heart or soul and return the negative feelings, but can't bear such injustice. He says that Sarbapev's acquittal is another slap in the face from the authorities, showing others that people with power will always be right. <laughs> As a mayor, he was responsible for everything. For instance, if someone gets injured at work, it is the head who will take the responsibility for the incident. He was the mayor of the town. And what was going on in the town at the time? There was war. 
Micro District 6 on the outskirts of Janaozian has not been fully occupied yet. Orak Sarwapayev used to be very proud of the area with some houses, hastily furnished and occupied mostly with immigrants from Turkmenistan. In fact, first he was accused of embezzling budget funds allocated for the construction of these very blocks. The prosecutors also claimed that the ex-mayor wanted to get ownership of an unfinished store as a bribe from a local businessman. People living in the premise say that either pitifully or cautiously, their life has been improved while Sarwapayev was in power. However, they confess that some officials from the city administration asked them to speak well of the ex-mayor. A young girl came and started persuading us to sign a letter of support. Of course we signed it, as he did provide us with a place to live. A plump girl presenting herself as an official from the city administration also visited me. I signed the letter as he has not done any harm to me. Thanks to him, I have an apartment, which I had waited for for so long, I couldn't even get one Baba Hanif was in power. Therefore, I am extremely happy and grateful to him. As it turned out later, the girls collecting signatures were not from the city administration at all, but representatives of the initiative group in Sarbapayev's support. They were drafting a letter on behalf of Jean Aozian residents to rescue the former official accused of embezzlement and corruption from sharing a prison cell with oilmen sentenced by the Mangistau court. Member of European Parliament Paul Murphy voiced his concerns regarding the trials of the Jean Aozian riots over oil workers as well as policemen. In his statement, Murphy notes that the human rights situation in Kazakhstan has worsened and verdicts against participants in the months-long strike are unjustifiably cruel, considering allegations of torture during the investigation. I want to express my very grave concern at the serious deterioration of human rights in Kazakhstan. In the past few weeks, we have seen the sentences in the cases of those supposedly accused of causing the riots in Janaozen in the west of Kazakhstan. Of course, we know that, those, uh, that the killings that happened up to 70 people, the responsibility for that lies with the state forces who opened fire with live ammunition onto unarmed crowds of protesters. So far, 13 protesters have been sentenced to jail between three and five uh, years. Uh, Rosa Tulataeva, who I met when I was in Kazakhstan, uh, was tortured and has been sentenced to jail for seven years. Uh, meanwhile, the police officers who've been sentenced, sentenced only five uh, police officers, have received jail sentences of between five and seven years, which obviously is nothing when you consider the massacre of people that took place, but in particular, those really responsible at the higher levels of the administration who gave the orders to bring live ammunition, who gave the orders to shoot, they haven't been brought to justice at all. And what's happening with the court case in Jan Ozen, uh, it's unfortunately the start of a process, or the continuation of a process really, of a crackdown on democratic rights and freedoms. Uh, there's likely to be another round of court cases. And at the same time, really, anyone who speaks out against the dictatorial regime in Kazakhstan is facing crackdown. On International Day in support of victims of torture on Tuesday, a special roundtable convened in Astana, though without raising the subject of prisoner humiliation in Janozien. In general, talks were held about the underfulfillment of the National Human Rights Plan ratified three years ago. Many international human rights organizations' recommendations were followed through. In particular, many people held in detention facilities are subjected to physical torture. Expert opinions in the next story. The national plan for the improvement of prisoners' rights and torture has been fulfilled only by 17 percent. The recommendations signed by the president in 2009 have not been followed through consistently, and there is no significant impact on the problem. As a consequence, Kazakhstan prisons are experiencing more uprisings and suicide attempts, all because of poor conditions. Don't believe when someone says that uprisings happen because prisoners demanded drugs or cell phones. As a rule, they happen because of systematic violations of prisoners' rights. The most notorious case in the penitentiary system of the country occurred in 2004. This footage shows a regular day in the alcoholic prison. The Foundation for Prisoners' Rights paid one of the wardens $1,000 to obtain the video. After it was released, the Justice Ministry responsible for the penitentiary system at the time took tough measures. Several officers were put to jail, and the population was promised that nothing like this would ever happen. These days, it is the Interior Ministry that is in charge of the penitentiary system and has to deal with various accusations. According to official data, nearly 1,500 officers were charged with abuse of office in the last six months, with 78 people eventually fired. Criminal cases were initiated against two policemen. At the same time, not only prisoners are subjected to systematic rights violations, but suspects as well. Most of all, law enforcement officers like to drag the paperwork while furnishing protocols to their liking. A person arrested at 1 p.m. can give all the information needed by 9. Most of the times, it's the operative's doing. Investigators don't need this. 
Adirhan Skakov decided to defend Kazakhstan's police. The man had worked in the MIA system for 20 years, and he is confident that accusations of his colleagues are not always justified. Apparently, law enforcement officials have to use force because they have no other way. They've been put into these conditions where they have to do this. Their superiors demand results or threaten dismissals. But officers have families to feed. What are they to do with deadlines ever pressing? So they resort to beating. In Russia, they have trade unions for the policemen. Why not here? We need to protect the rights of police officers. In the meantime, the International Bureau for Human Rights has been working on the new national plan. By the end of the year, human rights experts will develop a number of recommendations to enforce the rule of law both in the detention centers and prisons. One of the key demands is maximum transparency and NGOs' access to prisons at any time torture is reported. A charity exhibit was held in Almaty in support of children with cancer. Organizers arranged an auction at the end. Only $5,000 was raised. The money will be used to treat children with cancer, although the amount is so small, it will not be enough to even a single child's surgery. These types of events are becoming a fashionable trend in Kazakhstan lately. All would be well and good, but does the money reach those who need it? Our crew investigates. Mansur has been acting up the whole morning. It's all because of the chemotherapy, his mother explains. The boy has spent nine months out of his one-year life in the oncology clinic. Zulikha Ayazbayeva's son has a malignant tumor, a VI ball. One eye had to be removed, and the second one is under threat now. You know, I am very upset with the doctors who couldn't diagnose the disease on time. The reason why my son has already lost one eye, and now we can lose another one. Also, I am upset when babies turn one month, they are checked only by neurologists and surgeons. I believe that eye doctors should look at them as well. The small patient ward accommodates six people. The clinic does not have designated beds for parents. They have to sleep in children's beds. Local teacher Marina Mikunina says that people who have no money for the treatment abroad come here to the Children's Department of the Oncology and Radiology Institute. The state allocates a quota for treatment of our children, but naturally it covers only the medicine. Just like any other children, these kids want to eat something tasty or sweet and play with new toys, but they're so constrained financially that they can't afford even the most basic things. Rocks from sacred places, rice processed with tar. A newly discovered Almaty artist, Emila Dimisin, claims that her paintings have a healing power. Both children and adults look at the paintings, and at some point they start telling about their feelings, which is different for all people. Some see an old lady, some unicorns, or something else entirely. This is how these paintings work, I guess. During her first press conference, Tamila Demisin, who was unknown until recently, presented a film about herself and spoke about her upcoming world tour. Her paintings will be exhibited in London, Dubai, New York and Moscow. The artist plans to donate all the earned money to children with cancer. It seems like Darigha Nazarbayeva started a new trend for this type of charity. In April, the president's daughter also presented a personal biopic, My Star in Kazakhstan and Moscow. It was said that proceedings from the sales of 100,000 copies will go to cancer patients. But three months in, the new releases section did little to boost the popularity of the $13 DVD. At this point, it's not clear how much money children with cancer will actually see with this project. Tamila Dimisin's exhibit was presented in a luxury hotel in Almaty with all the expected elements – banquets, evening gowns, formal attire, champagne, desserts and celebrities. This is a big personal exhibit and this is a starting point into a great professional artistic career. I hope it will be a success, so please write good things about her. The key event of the evening was the charity auction. However, just one painting was sold, thus only $5,000 were raised in the end. At the same time, it is not difficult to estimate how much the party cost Damila. Hotel rent with catering and an after party come to a price of about $112,000. Russian TV star Valdis Pelsh, as the host, costs $30,000. And the appearance of Kazakh singer Rosa Rimbaeva is 10 times cheaper. The thematic design and models add additional $7,000 to the budget, on top of the presentation film with a cost of at least $30,000. The bottom line is somewhere around $200,000.
The Mila de Messine promised to give the money raised at the luxurious charitable event to the oncology department. $5,000 is just half of the amount Mansour needs to save his only eye. This money could also help Irina Zukova's daughter, who needs a surgery in Moscow. But due to the lack of finances, chemotherapy in Almaty is the only thing that the Zukov family can afford. <laughs> She went through a lot. She talks with a lot of children here and sees everything. It is hard and painful. My baby is tired of these trips because they give her all these chemo shots. There are 70 children like Lilia in the oncology department. Most of them are waiting for sponsored donations. Mansur has surgery scheduled in Moscow in the fall. So Zulikha has been trying to find money for several months now, as her son does not qualify for the state quota for treatment abroad. This is all we have time for now. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned.